Be here now. Just be here now. Hey everyone, it's Raghu back with Mind Rolling, and I'm here with Susan Eirich. And uh, we only met once before. And Susan, I haven't any idea at all of how I was so lucky to get to meet you. Uh, Susan is doing uh, incredible uh, work and uh, has uh, is the executive director of Earthfire Institute Wildlife Sanctuary and Retreat, Retreat Center. And this goes way beyond saving animals, everybody. And this is part of, uh, I, I hope, from time to time, I get more of an opportunity to do stuff around s- environmental sustainability and projecting how, what are the ways, presenting rather, what the ways are that we can reconnect with a place in ourselves that seems to be lost these days. And uh, Susan, welcome. Happy Thank to you. have you here. So, now, you've done a lot of different things in this life, uh, lived uh, in, in many different situations and so on. Just give us an idea, a little bit of like what really uh, presented itself for you to follow this dharma, we would call it in the East, this path uh, that, you, that has, it's in you that expressed itself out. And how did you first start even thinking in that way? I remember as a little girl having an argument with my mother about why I must have been four or five about why animals didn't have equal rights to humans. It just didn't make Mm. sense to me. It just didn't make sense. And that was just always in me, a love of nature and a connection to nature. But life being what it was, I ended up, I got a degree in biology, but um, as many of us have difficulties, I realized I needed to go into some good therapy and I was lucky to find really good therapy. Mm. Um, way outline, not way outside the norm. Um, and that interested me so much that I went and got a degree in psychology because it was utterly fascinating who we are and how we develop. But I missed being with nature. Mm. And so um, I'd loved wolves ever since I could remember being a little girl, which was made no sense at all because I'd never met one, but I just did. And when I came back from overseas, because I went traveling to, to live and teach overseas some, um, I heard that it was possible to get a wolf hybrid. Mm. Uh, someone had just started breeding them at that point. They hadn't been. And I said, well, I, I certainly can't have a wolf, but a wolf hybrid. It was like instant. Yes, I have to do that. And so I, I, I got one. And then I traveled around the entire country to meet everyone else who had one because I wanted to do right by him. It wasn't a wolf and it wasn't a dog and I wanted to do do right. So I traveled like 8,000 miles to everybody else who had one at that time. And in the process met um, my current partner, Jean, who was raising wolves for movies. Mm -hmm. And he was training them only with this profound kind of, I don't want to say mystical because it's not mystical because when you work with an animal that way it's very physical and visceral but he was working with them in such a way that there was a, just a connection between he and them. And so it was like almost instant that I wanted to share my love of nature and animals. And he had a way of handling them that mm. he could show them to the public. And it was a, a powerful, very powerful connection that we had, that we just had to do this together. Mm. Um, and so he was training for a movie, I think it was White Fang. And oh, yeah. they had some babies that they wanted for wolf cubs. And um, after the film, he took them to raise and he invited me to help raise them. Wow. And there are many powerful experiences in life. That was one of the most powerful I've ever had. It was holding these vibrant, vibrant beings up against my chest as I was bottle feeding them. I could actually feel 
I, I swear I could feel the oxytocin or the mother hormones flowing, even though it wasn't my species. And it just fascinated me. How could I feel so, so strongly about something that wasn't even my own species? And it began to just open a whole door about connection. To, you can feel that strongly about almost anything if you make the connection. And the, and the loving energy flows back and forth. Like uh, all sentient beings, you know? Yep. Like, so. And based on that, I named them, and one of them I named Earth Fire, because she was um, just a profound mothering being. And um, on the basis of that connection, I said, I can't have this the profundity of this experience of feeling who these living beings are and not share it with my fellow humans. I just can't. Hmm. And so I decided to found Earthfire. Right. Um, which I did. Can you, how, um, in, what is the process your partner takes on training? I, a, a wild animal and training is almost oxymoron. <laughs> it is. Now, any animal that he had was do was uh, domestically born, not captive, mm -hmm. not wild. Right. There's a whole business. But in still, Hollywood. yeah. I mean, even this dog right behind me. <laughs> well, she doesn't listen. I, to <laughs> I, <laughs> I know when that wild thing happens, and that's it. You know, it takes her over. He has a talent that I can't explain. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw him once. He had three wolves. I think it was for White Fang, too. He had three wolves standing on their mark. Stand, to begin with, to get a wolf to stay still, standing on their mark while the camera was working and he was sending them commands and they were standing there. Hmm. Yeah. And you could feel, it's like you could feel the beam going back and forth between he and they. So he's totally tuned in, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they know that. He's not really human. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Uh, now, before we get more into the reality, you're saying how much this, uh, you saw how important this was and that you wanted to share it with everybody. Um, and before we get into all of what you are intending with that intention, um, I just, you've lived in, in other incredible places. And one, of course, we've spent a lot of time in India and all. So Nepal, and you lived there. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? And it related to your work and how you collected what you have together to share. So I met an anthropologist in Nepal who invited me to go back to two villages one of which she was uncomfortable with and one of which she absolutely adored. And she wanted an objective analysis of, the, of it. Unfortunately, I agreed with her, so I wasn't much help to her. <laughs> but the second one was a Sherpa village on the border of Tibet. Oh, wow. And at the time, there was no way in except an eight-day walk, one way, no helicopters, et cetera. It was right, right on the border of Tibet. Um, Start there. Eight day walk into that area, which yeah is so wild and so elevated and difficult weather and all that. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, boy! So the first three days, to the first village, I went up by myself, which was also interesting. Oh, um, but I don't want to take time with incidents that happened there. But the village itself was utterly remarkable. It was very removed because it was so isolated. It was cut off in winter because of the pass. Uh, and it wasn't a tourist place at that time at all. And the thing that struck me most about it, and, and the anthropologist who had invited me there, mm. um, it was about 25 families. And the, the village, the main village was at about 12,000 feet. And then they had a second village where they would, would go in the summer for their yak at about 14,000 feet. And they had very little anything. The houses were stone. 
and it would snow and the snow in the house wouldn't melt. And you're cooking on a flat stone. That was the stove. Um, very, very little material possessions. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, well, we don't need them because we're connected to spirit. Mm -hmm. And the beauty. I mean, this was, I have pictured yeah. a stunning valley. <laughs> yeah. But what they would do, they had this, the one thing where I put their money and effort was this beautifully decorated temple. Mm -hmm. And that was the center of their life. And they had rules there agreed to by everybody um, that once a week, no, that once a month, someone would hold a feast. And it, it, over the, it was 25 families, over the period of a couple of years, everybody would be eating from everybody else's hand. But the feast had to be not very fancy, because if it was very fancy, we, the poor people would have to try and live up to it. So the point of it was really to hold the community together. And they had a rule. So they had the best preserved forests in Nepal. Um, mm. And part of that was because they had a rule that you can't cut green wood. Mm. You could only go and collect. The fires were very small anyway, the cooking fires, but you could only collect wood that was dead. And if someone violated that, they had someone who'd ch double check. If someone violated that, they would be fined. There'd be like the equivalent of a little court once a month in the meeting in this beautiful temple, small temple, but beautiful. And they would be fined and uh, tried and fined. And the fine was um, potato beer because they grew potatoes at that level. Very a very bubbly, fermenty kind of thing. <laughs> and um, they'd have to bring potato beer, which is a big deal because they were subsistence level. Um, and then everybody would drink it. Mm. And they'd end up dancing, and the person would have been tried, convicted, and brought back into the community all in one fell swoop. <laughs> it's considered a sin to make a child cry. They actually practiced some version of polyandry. Oh, really? Oh, my. Um, and one of the things that was most interesting to me was their, um, they didn't want to kill anything. They wouldn't even have chickens because chickens would eat bugs and kill the bugs. They were allowed to eat meat if something died naturally, but they didn't want to kill anything. And the story goes, one of the founding story goes is that they had someone who didn't listen to that and would, would go hunting. And no matter what they did, he wouldn't stop. And the community got together and said, what do we do? And they made this really interesting decision. And they invited him out. And they went to the edge of a cliff and said, look, there's some sheep down there. And they pushed him over the cliff. Oh, my. So wow. that, that was a founding story. I, I wasn't there, so I don't know if that's what happened. Yeah. But... Um, so that was a little bit of some time in Nepal. Wow. That's extraordinary. But on a whole, you know, having that kind of an experience, I mean, this directly relates to what you're doing now. Uh, share, the sharing you're talking about is sharing um, the kinds of wisdom that, that, as I said earlier, we are disconnected from now. And, uh, you know, like when you said... Part of the deal was you every month somebody would host, you know, uh, food. A feast, yeah. A feast. And everyone would be, have fed everyone after a certain amount of time. Yeah. I mean, this would be a big start just to say, gee, how can we translate that, you know, to, to, uh, to our culture in a way? Because our culture is so absolutely polarized at this time these are the kinds of things that uh, i'd say you know we have any hope it it is to bring in that uh, wisdom of uh, of of these people what were these people it was a nepalese sect or was it no they were sherpas just sherpa right mm -hmm. the sherpas mm -hmm. uh huh wow those amazing beings who take people to the top of uh, yeah. Everest and all that. So it was a Tibetan Buddhist culture. Hmm. Right, yeah. yeah. Which, yeah, we've met many uh, 
wonderful Tibetan teachers along the way since the days that we were in India. Yeah. So I, I want to just, um, there's something you wrote. I want to read it. Maybe you can expand uh, on it. As my awareness, and it really has to do with raising the wolves and what you said in the very beginning. As my awareness expanded and I realized I had to do right by all life, Falling in love deeply opens channels through which all kinds of information can flow. And I saw that each living being, plant, tree, animal, as a source of wonder, if only I was able to connect with each on its own terms. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, Susan. Can you talk about that, though? Uh, especially around with each on its own terms. There's, it's such an um, incredible wealth of wisdoms and intelligences and qualities in each, each life form. So the idea is to connect on the level at which we can find together, but on its own terms. So you're not trying to... Um, you're not actually even trying to understand. That's too intellectual. You're trying to feel how you how you connect. Right now, I'm looking at a tree outside the window, um, or it could be a wolf, or it could be a bear. Particularly with animals, um, there is a a bareness to bears, <laughs> and there is a wolfness to wolves. Mm. And it's important to be able to feel that quality that's unique to that species and then within that every single being is dramatically individual they're each a being and so i might have two bear brothers dramatically different um six wolf pups dramatically different mm -hmm. so it's it's not different than trying to connect with each human being each human being on their own terms the you feel the being the way that they are, you know, rather than laying trips on them or, or seeing through your own eyes, you try to feel and connect to who that person is, their particular everything. Um, for me, it's just a beautiful way to live. It's just, it keeps you alive hmm. and connected and supported in it, difficult times. Yeah, absolutely. And but in, you talk also about interspecies bonding, and you mentioned it when you started raising those wolf pups. You couldn't believe, you know, the kinds of feelings that you were that you were having. And and what what about? I know, like some dogs are, they're more able to share with you what's. Um, beyond the usual commands for eating and not being bad or whatever, there's something, an ESB is going on. Uh, some less, right? Now, in these wolves, yeah, tell us about that. So the, now they're full adults, right? I mean, they're well, with you. Well, some are full adults, some are still fairly young. Uh -huh. in, in my experience you find that quality of being more connected or less connected it's almost like it's sprinkled randomly um you don't know where you're going to find it i found it in in the supermax prisons where i worked um oh talk about that please <laughs> let me go back let me finish the wolves yeah for a finish one and then we'll, we'll all remember that okay as a profound profound stories there too oh. so the connections just work if you, if you if you form that channel between yourself and another being it just works it doesn't matter what the other being is and it's and it's a joyous thing um but so i have six wolf pups that are brothers and sisters Everyone's different, very different. Some are much more soulful, if you will. Hmm. Some are much more wild beings. 
And it doesn't, you can't, I don't think you can say it about a whole species. I think it really ends up being an individual thing. Um, one of our bears, Titan Totem, God, he was par- he was paralyzed. Um, not we got him first, and then he wasn't paralyzed, and something happened, and he was no longer able to walk. And it's another whole. I don't know how much time we have. Just very briefly, um, he was healed, um, which is a whole other story in itself. How he was healed, but before he was healed, he was just. I shouldn't say just. He was a magnificent, but a bear, bear, just a bear. Hmm. After he could walk again, hmm. something had switched in him, and people would come up to meet him, and they would burst into tears. Wow. It's almost wow. like they felt they were getting a, some kind of transmission or blessing. They, and this sounds really weird, but I had nothing to do with it. But what I often do is just try to report, you know. I didn't expect it the first time. I hadn't said anything to prepare it. And it just happens over and over and again. There's something that's emanating from him. And I think it's because he felt that humans had done something for him. And it was a similar experience with the cougar, um, who was, a, I have a picture of him. You definitely wouldn't want to meet him in the wild. And then he just softened until people could pet him and sit in a circle around him and he would just purr and look at every single person in that circle. Something switched. But not my, sickness. He didn't, he didn't have something like getting paralyzed. He didn't have a sickness. He, um, he was getting older. But I had a woman come who I have a lot of respect for, who is a communicator, which I am not. And she made a telepathic connection with him. And she said it was almost like a light went on. Like, oh, I can connect with humans? Wow. Oh. And from a scientific observation point of view, I would only say that he switched after that. If that's what actually happened, I couldn't promise you. <laughs> but he started welcoming people. Mm, really? Come towards him. And that stayed through the end of his life. Wow. Um, so that's the long way of answering. Um, you said that some dogs connect better than others. And I'm, I'm saying there's a quality that seems to be a quality in and of itself that's sprinkled around mm. different individuals. And it doesn't matter what the species is. Yeah, that's how, that's take how humans <laughs> and humans included. Yes, in one of these. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, the, the prison experience. Do you want me to talk? Yeah, about? yeah. Please. Oh, well, how did that? How did you get? <laughs> did you get there, Susan? Oh, I am a psychologist, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you, that's things. quite a thing: biology uh, and psychology. I was living know. in Nepal really enjoying the third worldness of it. And I said, do I really want to come back to the United States? The United States is kind of rigid and doesn't really support creativity. You know, do I really want to come back? Mm. Now sitting at a guest at the, in Kathmandu, there was a place at the time called the Kathmandu Guest House. And I was sitting there talking with someone saying, I don't know if I want to go back. And I said, well, why don't you try teaching Outward Bound? Mm. And because that was like, a, I'd be out in the wilderness, which I love, and that maybe I could make a transition that way, which I did. And, and during that time, someone mentioned, I was still complaining about, I can't take a regular job. I couldn't handle it. And I said, well, why don't you try teaching in the prisons? So I did. And I took to it like a duck to water. I loved it. Um, How so? I was, It was like being a light in the darkness. Mm. The first prison I went into uh, was in the East Coast. It was a uh, Greenhaven, and they just chopped up a guard and shoved her down a trash bin. And they decided to let me in right in the center of the prison because I had a theory, if you're going to do education, which anyway, I didn't know enough to be scared. And I just walked into the classroom and started talking to them. I was teaching psychology. I was asked, talking, there was abnormal psychology. I said, you know, are you guys abnormal? Um, 
and we started a good discussion and it was just beautiful. I went to some of the graduations because there was a college degree in there. Um, there was something, it was that same quality that I mentioned to you before. There was a connection between me and the class and we were less, so it was just beautiful. And then when I moved out West, um, I, I applied for a job at a supermax in Colorado. And um, I'm just trying to see what's most relevant to, to share with you. So I loved that work. It was a supermax with, it was guys and women, mostly guys. And they were all in a tiny one, with like it'd be 16 guys in what was called a pod and everybody would be in their own cement block the cement tomb almost with a little slit outside and they never could go outside and they had to be chained hand and feet to their waist just to cross the pod in order to take a shower when they're allowed that um supposedly the worst of the worst and most violent in the system and so i would go around and check with check on them to see that they were okay and they would ask to see me and there was one guy I saw, his IQ, I don't know, was maybe 90 mm. on the low, low average. Mm. He was a Hispanic guy. Um, and he was in for multiple rapes. And he asked to see me. Um, and so I started seeing him once a week or so, maybe twice a week. It was really hard work because you could feel the heaviness of his brain. Like when I'm talking with you, there's a lightness, like your brain works. <laughs> and yeah, with, a lot, with, a, with a lot of the guys in there, there was, oh God, that's a lot of work. <laughs> mm. um, but he came regularly and he did the work. And I, I didn't love seeing him because it was so much work. And yet every week he was there. And I don't think there was a single time that he didn't actually work because I don't just waste time there, you know, we try to get to, to real stuff. And eventually he admitted to me that he was getting worse and worse. And he had fantasies of being like Ted Bundy. And he was afraid that the next time he did a rape, he didn't get caught for most of them, um, that he might do something like Ted Bundy and that he didn't really want to. And so he sort of allowed himself <coughs> to get caught, which is a pretty remarkable thing. Wow. And one day the the point of the whole point of the story is one day we were talking and something opened in his eyes and I saw it and I, it was like the best I can say is almost like it opened as a window into his soul and I saw it and he saw me seeing it <laughs> and I saw him seeing me see it. And that was totally on his part. It was he who asked to come, he who did the work, he who did that. No, I, I was a facilitator, but he did that. And after that, he had been one of the most problematic um, inmates. He was constantly set down into um, isolation because he was always acting. He changed. Really? Wow. And it, it's not different. It's... Um, Something healing went back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know, I stayed there for five years until I decided I couldn't stand not being with the wolves. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this man somehow he had we would say karma of having that intention suddenly dawn in his relationship with you, the intention to let go. And to 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 just be transparent the way he was in that moment with you, he had to let go of something, and having that happen and the karma of that in the moment—that's that's pretty amazing. Considering how there was a vulnerability in him, yes, hmm. when he did that. Yeah, it's not all black and white. All of us, huh? Yeah. Amazing. Other um, inmates would thank me, saying they didn't think they could have made it through except for the humanity, because I actually listened. Hmm. And the other people there would like, oh, you're an inmate, and, and 
you know, diagnosed them with the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and I just made sure that all my notes were completely legible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that you would listen, I don't know. I'm pretty sure, well, I'm not positive, so I'll say I think Simone Weil wrote the most generous act that you can do in this world is to pay attention to people. Or animals. Or animals, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how many people just ignore animals because they have no connection. It's like how it's impossible for me to understand at different times. And the animals, I mean, this one... Absolutely knows, like all dogs in particular, you know, cats, anybody, they know when you are off. You are not connected. They absolutely know, and they're either very tentative or they bug them, like they'll bug that person. I don't, you know, they all react a little bit differently, isn't it? Just amazing. They, um, but my partner, who was, was very tuned to animals, would say, he didn't receive messages much. It was more like he was just connected with them. But he, one day he said, they say, why don't they listen? Meaning humans. Hmm. The simple answer is because we humans are so radically self-interested and wake up in the morning with my, my friend calls the movie of me. 24-7, everything is geared around, you're the producer, the director, the writer, the protagonist, the villain, you're everything for 24-7. And it's only when something opens up, and of course, the work that you do gets you in that present moment more of the time than not. But, you know, unless that happens, uh, it's, a, it's a hamster wheel. Very, very tough. It's sad because it's so, so much of a happier, richer life. If you're not thinking about yourself all the time, yeah, <laughs> on every level, I mean, physiologically, yeah. your immune system is better if you want to be practical about it. But it's also, it's, it's fundamentally living in joy. Hmm. Yes. Life, I, my, my way of thinking of it is life itself is a celebration. You see a, a seed burst forth, a baby be born. It's just hmm. celebration until the reality hits, but still un underneath that is still a celebration. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, here's another quote from, I'm quoting you, but they're really quite lovely, Susan. Falling in love begins with intimate contact, first with intimate contact. When we truly know and love an individual, we are moved to protect and nourish that being. See that it thrives. Falling in love is a natural result of a true connection with an individual, a dog, a cat, a bear, a bird, domestic or wild. It's the beginning of a journey to loving all of that species and then other species, and then to seeing the utter miracle of all of life. By doing so, we are moved to save wildlife while incidentally saving ourselves. Good segue to talk about the Institute and the work that you're doing and how meaningful it is beyond just saving. So my, I have the joy of looking after these animals and incredible experiences and insights because I live with many of them over their lifetimes. But the connection that happens becomes a portal into a larger way of seeing. Now, from a bear, you get to understand bears. And from there, you connect more to the forest. It's an opening into connecting to everything. I personally think it can happen anywhere with anyone. It can happen with a dog or a cat. It can happen in a city. I, I don't think it's a mistake to think that it's happening here because they're bears and wolves. It's actually a capacity we all have with connecting with any form of life, but it's particularly important to do it with animals like bears and wolves because we're killing them and we're not giving them any space to live. And so uh, one of the things I really want to do is help us as humans connect with these beings so that we really make a point of leaving space on earth for them. 
and to start with the bears and the wolves or the bison or the cougars or the other animals we have here. We have animals. I'm located near Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone mm-hmm. National Park. Mm-hmm. And the animals we have here are all native to the area, native to the greater Yellowstone, wider Yellowstone to Yukon Wildlife Corridor. Um, so that's what I work with and the importance of genetic flow to have wildlife quarters. So there's a whole conservation element to it, having the animals uh, help us understand the necessity to have interconnected habitats. So there's it's all that biological conservation. And we're located on a wildlife corridor ourselves here. Oh. Um, but more than that, to understand the incredible beauty and wonder and joy that's around us. It's like, we're so lost as such a waste. I mean, to be connected to life, would, if we really are, um, we wouldn't have any environmental problems because we wouldn't kill mindlessly, we wouldn't use mindlessly, we wouldn't use more than we need. We'd be constantly reinforced with love around us, but however you wanted to find love. Um, but one of the things that probably started, actually originally started with me as a cat, that wandered onto my farm in Kentucky, a scraggly little kitten. I wasn't Mm -hmm. especially connected to them and I fell in love hopelessly Mm -hmm. (laughs) with that particular cat. And then it was the wolves and it's the depth. So the work I'm trying to do here, other than helping us share, share the beauty with the rest of us and their brilliance and their intelligence and their spirituality, because they have a spirituality too, is the understanding I've come to, which millions of other people have too, I'm sure, that it's not just going out into nature or being with an animal, it's the depth of the connection. And I started calling it reconnection ecology um, because if you have a really profound connection, it transforms you. I think it literally physically does. I think it, I think it changes the whole nervous system and it can do so in an instant. Yeah. And then last a lifetime. A part of the work I do here is is um, encouraging other people, um, in addition to myself, to share, to, to remember these stories, to remember these connections, because I think most of us have them. And then we're told they're stupid or crazy or hide them away because they're not encouraged. And part of my work, the way I see it, is to help us reconnect to that part of ourselves. And from there, trust it, trust those experiences and the stories I've heard. It's like they pour forth from people Mm. Um, to trust it. So it's like reconnect to support us, to reconnect to those memories and then to trust it enough against all of the pressures that are there not to trust it. I mean, it would upend society (laughs) in effect if we really did that. And then to act from integrate it into ourselves consciously and actively, not just having a tucked away secret experience um, and act on that to do something for, for the rest of life. It doesn't matter what it is, whatever, su- whatever suits that particular person. So it's like from the connection here and, and when people come here, though, that it's limited. We, we, we're not a zoo. We have only custom visits and retreats. Oh, really? I want, I want people to be able to meet the animals. And I don't want the animals to be overwhelmed by too many people. Mm. Um, so the connection that people make here, um, I, I, they have it, they share it, we write about it. And the underlying mission or vision is to help us all reconnect with the wonder inside ourselves. And it's the same thing, really. You go inside to make the connections, and then from there you, you act like sacred activism, you will. Mm -hmm. It's it's a similar process, only specifically related to connecting with nature, ourselves and nature. That's the focus. Yeah, that's beautiful. You talked about trust. uh, And what comes up for me around trust always is intuition. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happened to me. It's how I got launched to go to India by Ram Dass. And it was trust and then intuitive space opened Mm. and i know that that's the same case for everything you're doing and and working with animals who are nothing but that and uh i think that's if if that experience could be translated you know out there 
You got? Have you got a book? I'm working on one. Yeah, because you got. Yeah, no, this is important stuff, and it, it would be a, a way to get it out there, for sure. So highly encouraged. Can you tell the story? Because, I mean, I, I've only I have been around. Um, uh, you know, wolves that were bred with dogs. So that was enough of a, a, it was a good friend of mine, a native person. And it was enough to give me a real sense of, uh, of being with the wild animals you're talking about. So I, I have a real feel for And then anybody who's had an, even a domestic animal has these qualities at, in them and, and it expresses itself from time to time. So, yeah, uh, the passing on of that kind of intuitive relationship with the world is, to me, a huge, huge thing. And, and I, in terms of spiritual um, grounding, I have always insisted that every one of us, and you've said it too in one way or the other, or just directly, everyone has, I would call it, an ineffable experience that your mind is not involved with, but it is so powerful that it does connect you inside trust and intuition, and that you can fall back on all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why I think this work you're doing uh, related to us being able to make changes uh, in our, at least in our perspectives, is really important. I really want to support that. And I don't want to say in people because that makes people different from me. I want to support that in us mm-hmm. because that, that is the way that we'll make the changes we need to make. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you tell the, the, the uh, story about cucumber the wolf? I... <laughs> it's a long story. Okay, we, we got time. We still got time. Don't worry. Cucumber was an absolutely charming, demanding being. She was um, a runt. And she was like a little half-sized wolf. And she was living basically a wolfly life trying to be queen, running around with the largest male around. <laughs> um, but she was pretty much not that connected to humans. And then one day I saw her, it's like I felt from behind a, a plea. And I turned around and she was standing there shaking. Um, the wild animals don't show their illness until it's near the end because they, they shouldn't. I rushed her to the vet. And she was um, near death. Um, The vet said she had blood poisoning and she was really weak. And uh, she would have to do an operation to find out what was wrong with her. But she was too weak to survive the operation. Uh, I never give up on an animal (laughs) until until they're dead. Um, I said, what? I don't care. I mean, if she's going to die anyway, do the operation. And they did like a four hour operation. I was sitting outside the door and they cut her open and they finally found what had happened that part of her intestine had died and crawled up on itself. And so there was an intestinal blockage Mm. and it had died. And so she had this dead stuff in her abdomen and she's filled with peritonitis, Mm. et cetera. Mm. And they managed Mm. to, to clean it, to resection it, even though it was in a delicate place. And she died to, essentially died twice on the table. Um, and they resurrected her with extra, you know, all the stuff that you do to resurrect and that, uh, any being that's part has stopped on the table. And she made it through. But she was um, really, really weak and it was touch and go for a long time. We brought her into our, our little log cabin, which had a heated floor. This is in the dead of winter around, right around New Year's, Christmas. Mm. And she needed constant care and she couldn't feeding, et cetera. But she started to recover and a light came back into her eyes. And then she kind of decided she kind of liked it in the cabin. Um, We said, no, no, you can't have a wolf in the cabin. So we put her out with a very handsome wolf. And the howls and the complaints and the betrayals that we'd abandoned her and kicked her out. Mm. Um, (laughs) Unbearable. So we came to a compromise. 
And the compromise was that we'd bring her in for a breakfast and uh, let her spend a little time in the cabin with us. And then we put her out. In the meantime, uh, my partner and I were meditating. And so we'd sit and we had a little Tibetan bowl and we'd sit and we'd do a meditation. She'd, she'd come dashing into the cabin, smashing open the door with full energy and rushing over to a food bowl. And um, then we start meditating and she'd come over. And I have a little bit of film footage of this. Oh. She would start, I would, we'd ring the bell and she would start to circle us. Like one time, two times, three times. And then she'd settle down and go to, uh, to sleep under the table with, with the dog we had at the time. And then we'd ring the Tibetan bowl at the end and she'd get up and she'd circle us one time, two times, three times. Circumnabulate. And it was really clear that she was tuning into the energy and that she, again, like, like with that inmate um, I mentioned, this was totally on her. We didn't do anything. They just tuned to it. So that went on for a while. Then there was a woman, there was another wolf we had who nearly died. Um, her name was Apricot. And she had distemper to her brain, which is supposed to be 100% fatal, but it wasn't. And, but she was all twisted like someone with epilepsy. Mm. And I invited someone to, I couldn't stand to see her that way. She was, the world was so alive and vibrant. And Western medicine couldn't do anything. They said prednisone, um, mm. which is not good. So I invited someone who did, worked specifically in human nervous systems to do some, of some sort of version of craniosacral. Uh. And this is a video that I have that's actually on our website. Um, I don't want to go too long into that. That's a whole other story. But basically, you can see it. You can see her going into a healing trance. You can, I, have, I have a video of her right up in her eyes, and you can see her going into a trance. Wow. And then coming out of it. And she would go into the trance for perhaps, perhaps 45 minutes or so, and you could see her breathing change. And in the end, she healed completely. And how was I connecting that back to cucumber? Um, oh, All right. so someone saw that film and called me up and said, I've got to, I, I'm a shaman. She was a white person, but she'd studied in Peru and she had really good ethics. She said, I do ceremonies for animals in zoos because they're looked at all the time. They have all this negative energy. I go in after hours and do ceremonies for them. And I saw your video and I have to come and do a retreat at your place. And two months later, we had a full retreat and she came. And during that retreat, my partner, Jean, decided that cucumber was ready to meet humans. And so they were sitting in the, in the yurt. We have a yurt where we do the retreat and everyone was sitting there quietly. They'd already been with this shamanic perspective for a couple of days. So they were quiet and receptive. And she suggested they hold their energy back. And John walked Cucumber over to the yurt where she'd never been before and said to her on the way, now there's people in there who need, you know, mentally, there are people in there who've never met a wolf and they need to see a good little wolf. He meant it in a mm -hmm. positive way. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to go. You don't have to do anything you want. So he came to the bottom of the stairs and she had her ears back and her tail between her leg. And he said, and they were in there waiting with the door open. And he said to her mentally, you don't have to go in if you don't want to. And she kind of straightened up and went in ahead of him into the yurt. And I have a couple of a tiny bit of video footage of that. And she went and greeted every single person. There are about 12 people. No. Every really? single person in the yurt. Oh and then when she came to Rose, which is the name of the, the shaman, Rose said she started shaking because she heard from Cucumber, oh, there you are. You're the one who brought me here. I want to be the best little wolf. I, I don't think it was the exact words, but the best wolf ambassador I could be. Mm -hmm. And she had no way to know that John had done it. John had just done it spur of the moment. He didn't know anything. But she, there you are. And after that, she became one of our best wolf ambassadors. I could trust her with people um, completely. Mm. And she lived a long life. 
Wow. That's quite a story. Susan. There's another side to her you might want to know, which was um, mm. she loved being in the house. She didn't want to be kicked out. She loved the attention. And one day, it was another freezing cold midwinter night. I turned around and there she was shaking. And I had a Malamute at the time who sh cucumber saw go in and out of the house. I really pissed her off. <laughs> and um, but one day she was just shaking like a leaf. And had, oh, God, not again. And brought her into the house for the heated floor, et cetera, and, and called the vet. But the vet wasn't able to come till the morning. And she, she came into the house limping. I can't explain to you how pathetic she was. It's like every little step she was about to die. Everything was drooping. She was just, and then she lay down on the floor. Next morning I got up, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, cheerful, waiting for her breakfast. <laughs> she conned me <laughs> into bringing her in. <laughs> hey, well, that's... Uh... The, a wolf does have a nature like that. <laughs> the of? acting was superb. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with her. Oh, my God. <laughs> that's so great. So oh. it's important. I bring that story up because it's important. You don't want to just, oh, my God, they're these wonderful spiritual creatures. Hell no. They're also very visceral being, alive, <laughs> biological, mischievous beings. Yeah. <laughs> we all have that going. Don't I we? hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just uh, one one more quote, which to me is the essence of, of the work that you're doing and how important it is uh, to share it with us in the West for the most part. Uh, really, as I, I keep saying over and over, we have we are not connected. Look at what we are manifesting. Uh, and for hundreds of years, in so many different ways, it's coming home to roost. And you say, often a deep shift in consciousness occurs when we share with each other the profound, inexplicable experiences we've had with wildlife. It is vitally important that we support one another as we explore the nature of our human journey and the nature of reality beyond the constraining norms of commonly accepted reality. This, uh, so, um, this is a real path, uh, and it is an easy path. It just requires a little bit of openness to receiving a being that isn't sitting there judging you know the human condition is rough and 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 many of us have trouble with that but with an animal you have so much of uh, advantageous moments that that are present when you can just open up a little bit and and connect in that way and it you know look at this this work you're doing is so great Susan to allow people to uh, understand that and share in that um, and you, now you say you do, people can visit, or it's in a very, in a, in a retreat atmosphere more than just obviously just. Well, do a few custom visits or a retreat, yes. Yeah. But we don't do too many because they're very intense and we want people to have real experiences so we keep them small mm. and only do a few each year, but yes. Uh huh. And all of that will be available on the website? Yeah. Okay. So. Everybody, the website is uh, earthfireinstitute.org. Mm -hmm. So earthfire, as it sounds, institute.org. And, and, and by the way, I, I have this up here somewhere. I want to just look at it. Um, the, uh, some of the things that you do there are... Like you have one part of your uh, site that's Earth Fire Stories, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just looking through, and and, uh, and you know, there's a lot around our stories and re. I think you should mention something about that. I think that's very important to to the work that uh, you've been doing. Is really a confirmation of you know our stories are important and sharing them.
Yeah, talk yes. about that for a sure. Well, in the sh- in the sharing of our stories, two things happen. One, well, many things happen. One is that we're able to hear our own stories, which makes them more real. We're able to share them with others who hear them, which makes it more real. Mm. We encourage others to uh, find their own stories. I did one storytelling circle. It was just amazing. One woman told something she'd never told before, and then another told something they'd never told before, and another told something that they hadn't remembered for years. And it just opens each other. And it's even though the stories were specifically about a connection with nature, at the same time, it created a beautiful human connection. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and we all have them, too. Mm-hmm. It isn't yeah, your extraordinary story of raising wolves is not more extraordinary than someone else's that doesn't have a wild animal involved necessarily, but it could be a walk through the woods. Absolutely. It makes right. no difference at all. Yeah. It's connecting with some part of nature other than yeah. yourself, yeah, and other than other than human. You know, uh, Ramdas has a story that he used to tell a lot. You know, why don't you treat humans the way that you treat when you go in the woods? And there's all kinds of different shape trees, tall, short, uh, in all kinds of different conditions, and you don't judge any of it. Why are you doing that with people? You know, so that was a famous thing. And so true. And one reason to spend time in the woods, aside from just breathing in what it, what it offers, the power of it. Oh, boy. You said this, something very interesting. You said it's so easy. It's there for us. And yes, it's almost like nature itself is waiting for us to reconnect. Hmm. It's not just... And the path is, is easier for us with animals because they're more like us, but... We can make that connection in a forest. Yeah. That an animal is it's, it's everywhere. It's just waiting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and responsive. Yeah. I was just in the Sierras with the sequoias. I had never seen them before. Uh-huh. And it was just extraordinary. Um, it, it was uh, a, what's happening, of course, the expression of, of what we have done with uh, a lot of the forest below the sequoias being devastated by beetles and just dead, aside from the fires. I mean, the level of devastation and then the level of beauty of these sequoias, you know, so thousands of years old. Uh, What a world we are in right now. It's just amazing. Thank you so much, Susan, though. It's so great to hang out with you. Pleasure hear the stories. I love them. And uh, and we'll uh, make sure that everybody out there, you'll go to uh, beherenownetwork.com slash mindrolling and you'll have all of the show notes and connections and connecting to uh, the Institute, the Earth Fire Institute and uh, Susan's work. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Be here now, network.com, and enjoy all the podcasts.